Okay, so we will begin. Uh, we are really happy to, to have you uh, to uh, join us uh, after lunch on this research corner. So thank you to be there. Uh, I'm Olivier Galichet. I'm a, I used to be a firefighter for 20 years. And uh, actually now I'm consultant in the crisis management and the digital, digital projects. Um, I work for the fire services and for the Ministry of Interior in the National Operational Center. And I made digital projects like Advanced Mobile Location, uh, the creation of the Digital Agency for Civil Security in France. And uh, we worked, uh, when I was in the ministry, on a research project who, which called uh, Massive uh, with Telecom Paris and Caroline Riza, which is the president of ISCRAM, the association um, uh, for the research. Uh, Caroline, um, unfortunately, cannot be there. Uh, but uh, Rob and I are uh, both from Iscrum. And um, in a few years before, uh, we discussed with Ina to make this research corner to discuss about the connection between practitioner, researcher, and industry. Uh, but um, first of all, Iscrum has two, uh, two main goals. So I, I don't have the website, uh, please. <laughs> If we can have uh, just, uh, thank you very much. As uh, Iscram has two main goals. The first is to promote cooperation with all parties involved. So we can see that we have researcher in uh, IENA, uh, we have uh, practitioner and we have industry. And the goal is to join everybody to make some, uh, to improve rescue technologies and uh, practices. And the second goal is to disseminate research results and best practices. Uh, we can see that uh, in, during this conference, Irina, we have a lot of input, of research input with FR Alert, uh, with Johnny Duvinet, who made a lot of research to objectify the things to improve the technology. We have uh, research on citizens involved um, uh, rescue chain. Uh, with uh, the emergency warning system with Galileo, we saw this morning. And uh, so we can, we can see that now the cooperation is concrete and uh, real between uh, uh, researcher and uh, practitioner. And um, OK, to, to finish my, uh, my uh, introduction, if you want to collaborate with us, you can uh, go to the website. And first of all, you can go to the publication. We have a digital library with nearly 2,000 papers on all the topics that we saw during this conference uh, for the uh, um, uh, information system for crisis and management. So you have a lot of papers that you can uh, read and uh, use for your uh, own uh, work. Uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter of Iscrum, and you can also become a member of this crime to, go, to come to the conference and be a part of the community of uh, the, the association. Uh, during this session, we will, we will have four speakers who will, uh, will present their research work. And uh, we will begin by Haim Rafalowski, which is the disaster management coordinator Uh, from Magen David Adam, sorry if I made mistakes, Israel, and he will present us No Fear Lessons Observed, We Need to Bring Health Care and Crisis Management Closer. Please, Haim. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity of uh, being here. As I was presented, my name is Haim Ofalovsky, I'm the Disaster Management Coordinator of Magen David Adam, and I'm here on behalf of the No Fear Project, which is a project funded by the European Commission under the uh, Horizon Framework. No Fear started before COVID. And uh, we uh, were set up basically because the acute care of patients is a totally fragmented sector. If you look into the players, uh, we are the EMS, the Emergency Medical Services, uh, all over the world, at Magenda Vidadom, the Red Star of David is the national EMS for the State of Israel. We have the uh, emergency department, but if you look into where do we belong to, you would see that we are all over the place. We have private actors, we have public actors, we have 
actors that are NGOs like uh, Magen David Adom, like uh, Johanniter in, uh, in Germany, like the Red Cross in many countries. Um, some of us belong to uh, the Ministry of Health, some of us are hospital-based, some of us are uh, under the, a city, some under a state, some under a, a country. So there is no one place where all the stakeholders in the acute care of patients can come together, discuss and share experiences. And this is a major challenge, especially when it comes to those very rare incidents it's called security-related incidents. Sorry for my French. That's the way we call terrorist attacks. Organizations, if ever, have one in their lifetime. They have their lessons observed. And when you listen to lessons observed from uh, the bombings in Madrid, from the London Bridge, from the runover in Nice, and uh, runover in Berlin, what is horrible, and I have no other word than to say horrible, is that the same lessons observed come over and over again. Why? Because they are scattered. Because we don't share that information, so we cannot learn one from the other. So the idea of No Fear was to create a network of practitioners, academia, and the tool providers, the industry, to bring us all together to talk about crisis management, our response, and to do it better. So um, we are organized in the project under three, we call it, we call them the main pillars. One of them is the actual treatment of the patient. Uh, the Policlinico Gimelli, the hospital of the Pope in uh, Italy, uh, is leading that uh, work package. There are a lot of questions. Blood on the field, good or bad, the use of Reboa on the field, good or bad, uh, what is better, stay and play or bring the trauma patient fast to a hospital, they're there. Work uh, package five is around uh, training. We, because in our profession, it's about skills. It's not about knowledge. I don't need paramedics who know in their heads. I need paramedics or doctors who can do with their hands. So how do we do this transformation from knowledge to skills is a major uh, issue. And our colleagues from Crimedim are leading that work uh, package and we are, uh, Magen David Adom are leading the work package on the operational side of, of things, the collaboration, the cooperation with fire department, civil protection, police, other law enforcement, and the citizens. And then came COVID. And COVID brought us to a point that, to be very honest, we had no idea. If I go back to those horrible days, end of January, beginning of February 2020, we had no idea idea. We understood that we have a very serious disease which is killing people, which is spreading very rapidly, and that was it. Are we going to treat it as SARS? Hong Kong, China had SARS, or is it an, a new Ebola? Just to be very dramatic. So we said, okay, we have a network. We have a strong network, and a strong network means two things. People are willing to cooperate, and you have trust. And what I would be for my whole life, I, I have a huge debt to the colleagues, in, mainly in Italy, because they were the first affected in Europe, especially in northern Italy, and the colleagues from Crimadim are from there. And we said, we know you are not sleeping, but please sleep one hour less and tell us what is going on. And there we were willing to tell us what is happening. It is not scientifically validated. It, is not, it was not a real research. It was a real-time knowledge sharing. And everyone put its own grass of sand into it. And, and you can see uh, how uh, we had a huge amount. Uh, things like Chile, because of its geography, was the, were the ones who were doing the longest air transfers of patients. And that used later the French, because when they had their outbreak in the French Polynesia and had to bring patients from French Polynesia to what they called the mainland, they said, OK, we heard the Chileans. And for example, a very simple thing. You need much more medications to sedate your patients in an airplane. We don't know what is the science behind it, but it is clear that it is needed. 
And when it comes to a long flight, of course, logistics become uh, an issue. The idea that we cannot transfer the really sick patients, it's horrible, but they will not survive the transfer. You need to find those who are sick enough to require ICU before they require ICU and transfer them on the right time. This is the kind of lessons learned. And a simple example, and I will finish by that, there is uh, in COVID something which is called the silent hypoxia. When I was trained as a paramedic, previous century, I was always told, trust the patient, not the monitor. Which means if you see something on the monitor and the patient clinically is not presenting that, look for a faulty device, not a faulty patient. And then came COVID and the patients were smiling with a saturation level of oxygen in their blood of 85. And in minutes they crashed and you had to ventilate them. And finally, we had to go to all our paramedics and say, trust the pulse oximeter. The pulse oximeter is the indicator that your patient will crash. I don't know how many lives we saved by saying that. Because until that moment, it was like, ah, low batteries, low contact, the patient is called, yada, yada. And it was a reality which was extremely important. So, uh, there are more. I spoke about all this, so I will skip it. We had a challenge. After two years, we said, OK, we have a ton of lessons observed. Some of them were right at the time we wrote them. For example, you need to disinfect your ambulances three times a day with bleach, 3,000 ppm of bleach. After one month, we realized that we are destroying all our equipment, all our vehicles. And COVID is not that bad. So you can bleach with 1,000 ppm, which is less destructive, and still have a safe car without ruining your cars. An example of something which was right, it is no longer right. So we said we will accumulate all our lessons observed and go through a process of observations from our users, from our researchers, to see what is valid and what is uh, not. And you can see that uh, we ended with almost 80 items uh, with on, under uh, different categories that we decided that we will have to look into uh, the human factor, knowledge sharing, equipment and supplies, SOPs, and PPE as a very specific thing, because PPE, we all know, was a major challenge. What were the winners of, uh, of the process that we had a consensus are the most uh, important? The issue of information sharing. And to put, it, to put it very bluntly, the capacity of our medical director who uh, had to stand in front of paramedics and EMTs with a lot of experience and say, guys, I don't know. I really don't know. This is the best evidence we have today. Could be in 48 hours it will change, but we are doing the best we can based on the information we have. That created trust. And in those difficult days, trust was, uh, was a key. And uh, the understanding of people, we work based on protocols and we were driving our people crazy because we were changing the protocols every 48 hours. Today, uh, this is the threshold for intubation and tomorrow that is the threshold for intubation because we realized that early intubation for patients with COVID, with COVID is bad. It decreases their chances, it doesn't improve their chances as it would always uh, be. Uh, the uh, other uh, issue, which is obvious, uh, is the need for a stockpiling of PPE, but with PPE which you can use for longer periods of time. Israel, summertime, 35 degrees, 70% of humidity, and you are in your PPE for three, four hours. Really, it's impossible. It's impossible, you breach your PPE, so we need, and for example, we went to the industry. We still don't have a good solution for that. But we went to the industry and said, guys, we need something which is nicer to use. Another issue, the PPE is not gender friendly. And uh, the other thing, which is about standardization, you receive a PPE which comes from China. It says extra, extra, extra large, 3X. In my case, it gets, to my, it gets to my knees. And then you realize the hard way that different countries have different size using the same, the same letter. So, uh, and 
another thing that we never thought about. We are today rely, relying on transportation for parts. For example, nobody uses, has spare parts for the radios in-house. What do we have? Two batteries? And then suddenly there is no international air freight and you don't get your supplies. I know. I will uh, <laughs> run into two more uh, things. Um, Real-time training and uh, the need uh, to be flexible in your job uh, designation and everything will be on the website so you can uh, see them. Psychological support. Um, the need to create search capacity. And here, for us, a critical issue is that healthcare professionals are not trained in crisis management. Healthcare today is a consensus-based profession. If I have a patient and I have doubts, I call what is called in our profession a concilium a lot of doctors, and ask for their best ideas. And if we don't agree, we go to home, we do research, we call more experts, and we do it again until we agree. Healthcare professionals are not used to the idea that you go to a meeting, there is a chairperson, which is normally an elected official, who is with the title of crisis management, and she or he say, one hour, by the end of the hour, we have a decision. Either way, there is a decision. And when you ask why one hour, because, and they say, because we have a press conference in one hour and 30 minutes. And it's already called, and there will be a decision. For healthcare professionals, it's extremely difficult. For the crisis management people, when you come and say, we will take a decision today, we will see the results in 14 days. And in those 14 days, you cannot change the decision. Because if we change the policy, we will restart the clock. And again, we will need 14 days to see results is not the way they think. So we need to bring those two professions together and start training and doing simulations together because the, when the next pandemic comes, and it will come, we will face the same issues. Thank you very much, and please stay safe. Thank you very much. It's really difficult for a passionate researcher to, to speak only 10 minutes, and we are really sorry, but we need to, to go on. Maybe we have one question on the public. However, we, we can speak for sure after the session or on the social event, uh, we can uh, speak of all of that. No question, actually? Okay. So we will uh, go to the second uh, speaker, which is Rob Grace, the vice president of ISCRAM, nearly president, um, who will uh, present for us the collaborative information seeking during a 911 call surge case study. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. OK, hello, everyone. Um, so I'll, today I'll talk about uh, an example of uh, an emergency that created a surge of 911 calls to a PSAP. And I'm looking at this case study with colleagues and uh, an early adopter PSAP to understand what are the requirements for not just technologies, but workflows, including protocols, uh, that can allow uh, a PSAP to take in multiple streams of uh, multimodal data and gather information, make sense of it to improve an emergency response. Okay, so very quickly, I, I want to just introduce the idea that there are two challenges. The first is uncertainty. The second, uh, ambiguity. And I want to highlight those challenges in this case study of a call surge that occurred uh, near Phoenix, Arizona and uh, then point to some questions about opportunities uh, related to the adoption of uh, sensor systems and uh, multimodal data in PSAPs. 
Okay, so by uncertainty, I just want to mean a lack of information. This could be a, a caller unable to answer a call taker's question. By ambiguity, inconsistent information. One caller might uh, say that the suspect is in location A. Another caller might say that the suspect is in location B. We see this in occasions like active shooters, uh, large-scale traffic accidents that generate a surge of emergency phone calls. Uh, for example, there is a shooting on the campus of a university in Michigan, and in a short span of time, there were over 100 911 calls made, and callers named at least 50 locations where they claimed uh, the active shooter was located. For the PSAP, this creates uh, a high level of ambiguity that they, they then uh, transfer to the first responders. So, Simply put, I'm thinking of cases where uh, callers might not know the answer to a question or cases, ambiguous situations where multiple callers are giving multiple answers to the same question. Um, so looking at, I'm looking at a, a case study of existing call taking uh, and how do call takers deal with challenges of uncertainty and ambiguity uh, during an emergency call surge? And then what are the implications for the adoption of new tools that are designed to uh, make, gather and make sense of multimodal data from a variety of sensors? Okay, this particular emergency involved uh, a shooting, involved uh, a search for a suspect near Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, in a, the span of an hour, over 136 calls about this incident were received by the primary PSAP. And uh, among those callers, there are at least 15 different locations that were reported uh, uh, for the suspect. And it was a large-scale police response that involved uh, ground units, they launched uh, an aerial drone, they had a helicopter. The incident was resolved uh, with the capture of the uh, suspect and luckily no one was harmed or injured in the, uh, in the incident. Okay, so first I just wanna highlight that out of the 136 calls, only 25 provided any type of information about the shooter. So there is a high level of uncertainty. Many, most of the callers heard the sound of gunfire, but didn't have any further information. For the PSAP, that meant that there was a high volume of calls that did not provide informative information. Uh, there was also a high level of ambiguity. Uh, of the 25 callers that reported information about the suspect, uh, they pointed to 15 separate locations, and ultimately only three of those were accurate. Looking at a, looking at a map uh, of where the calls originated, you can see in the large, uh, the large uh, shape that uh, callers who only heard the sound of gunfire, uninformative calls, were geographically remote from the origin of the incident uh, labeled with the black dots. Uh, informative callers, those who had some sort of uh, information about a possible suspect, is in the smaller uh, shape. And then only that green box were those callers who had uh, accurate information about the suspect. So you can see that, unsurprisingly, People who were close to the shooting gave the best information. However, the PSAP received many calls from geographically remote callers who did not have information about the incident. This is a challenge, of course, for the PSAP, who has to manage the surge of calls and find those callers that give high value information that they can then provide to the, the responding officers. Um, so one thing I want to highlight 
uh, from the from this incident is that uh, in a way the call takers worked collaboratively to find high value callers in a way that they typically don't uh, for you know an incident reported by a single party. Um, there are additional challenges in the sense that you know. PSAP cannot pre-filter calls that are coming in. They're taking them first come, first served. Uh, there's not really as I'll speak to this in a minute, but there's not an exist at the time an existing procedure for modifying the call taking script that uh, call takers follow. And uh, at this time, there was no uh, contextual data or supplemental sources that could enrich the uh, calls that were they were receiving. Okay, so as, as most of you know, you know, typically call takers follow a, a call taking script and they work roughly ind generally independently. They're speaking with a single caller reporting uh, a discrete emergency. In this case, in this case, there was a flood of or a surge of callers all reporting the same emergency. And the call takers became aware, once the call takers became aware of that, they began to shift the call taking script to focus on uh, the information they needed at the time. So this is just an example, but you know, the, the first calls were taken as normal, uh, following the uh, typical script, taking time to uh, interrogate the caller about the location, about the nature of the emergency, about the people involved. Soon after, other call takers began focusing particularly on the suspect location. This was the uh, gap in information gathering that was, was there, and callers modified bottom-up uh, the call taking process uh, based on an awareness of what information other call takers had collected and were focusing on gathering uh, new information that would be uh, actionable for the responding officers. Um, here's a short example. I just want to focus on the call taker quickly moving to understand if the call taker has seen anything, uh, and in this case they did not. Uh, and so they quickly disconnected with the, the caller uh, to, in order to answer more calls, in order to find uh, informative uh, callers. All right, so you can see that you know, the initial calls, the average call time was 149 seconds. Adapting the call taking script, uh, average call times went to 41 seconds. Uh, for the surge of calls. And then as the call volume lessened and callers began providing more uh, suspect information, those call processing times were higher as they interrogated the caller about uh, what they think or they uh, observed about the, the shooter. Okay, so here are my, here are my questions and here are my, uh, kind of the directions we're proceeding on our uh, additional work. So what are the opportunities for addressing uncertainty in a PSAP with the addition of you know, multiple streams of data uh, gathered by maybe a communication specialist or call taker who has access to uh, these tools? Uh, obviously, there's the opportunity to address gaps in the information that callers provide. However, it's uh, as the case study we looked into, it's not simply a matter of technologies and the availability of data. It's really, it would involve uh, greater levels of coordination among callers or, or among call takers, excuse me, to identify gaps uh, and address those through the search of additional data sources. Additionally, you know, there has to, because of the nature of the time critical situation, there needs to be uh, either through uh, different uh, technology-assisted search, semantic queries that allow a, a communication specialist to quickly search 
data streams that might be coming from cameras or other sensors in order to understand, uh, to quickly find information about a gap. So for example, a uh, communication specialist might have to say, you know, person in a blue shirt, and then they would search camera feed for uh, the last 10 minutes of people matching that description. There's simply not time enough for a human to maybe work through uh, some of these streams. Lastly, what are opportunities for the reduction of ambiguity? Uh, again, there could be an opportunity to verify or contextualize the reports of 911 callers. Um, however, as we observed, there's uh, a difficulty in uh, dispatching this information to responders. Procedures now, the dispatcher simply provides locations that were reported by callers. The addition of uh, new sources of information can increase this information and create a lot of cognitive load for the incident responder who has to understand, you know, and make sense of these various locations and in, in their decision making. So the nature of the protocols of how a dispatcher is dispatching this information uh, would also have to be addressed with the adoption of these tools. So there's a quick, uh, quick uh, pointing to some of the questions that came up in this case study. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your questions and talking with you uh, more if you have interest in, in our work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Do, do we have any question in the room? Yes, please. Come. Thank you. Uh, my name is Henrik, and I come from the Norwegian Police IT Unit. And I was wondering if you have done any research about situations where there are multiple incidents happening at once. So for example, when you get a surge of calls from one incident, and another one happens, It's a good question, and I don't have a good answer for that. You know, during this case study, for example, they were still processing, uh, you know, typical emergency calls at the same time. Uh, the calls that I included in the graphs were just those related to to the shooting. Um, my first thought is just that it uh, increases the, you know. Uh, complexity of the situation. And uh, I mean, one thing I didn't speak to, it's in the our paper, is that there could be opportun opportunities uh, for perhaps you know, routing calls based on uh, location. I don't, you know, this is, would be a, a, a difficult task. But uh, currently, I, I, I don't have a good answer to, to what, what's a real problem that you, you highlight. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, maybe we will continue because uh, time flies and uh, it's a really interesting sub subject, but uh, we need to go. So now we will uh, welcome Johnny Duvinet, which is professor in Avignon University. And we'll speak about uh, the cell broadcast in France, uh, the hedge as a surprising factor when people receive cell broadcast notifications. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, nice to meet you. Uh, so my name is Johnny Duvinet, and thanks to Iskram and, and Ina to invite me twice during this conference, and the, thanks to the French Ministry of Interior to funding uh, our research, and Roman Mouta is, is present in the audience. So this study aims at presenting you the early findings uh, of, uh, on a recent sample observed on the age as a surprising factor um, when people received in real time a CB notification related with, with intrusive sound. Sorry. Okay. So, research context um, observations uh, of the uh, body language of people receiving CB notifications show feelings with different negative connotations like fear, stress, anxiety, uh, skepticism, denial, or disbelief. Uh, we also know that different people 
react or can do nothing or do not change their behavior, even if you send them one alert. And many researchers return uh, to this familiar problem of milling. Um, if the recipients or people are uncertain about any of the content uh, received or about how they should proceed, they will seek additional information which may delay uh, protective or taking protective actions. However, knowing what people feel and how they react receiving, receiving sorry, real cell broadcasting alerts becomes salient because there can be dire consequences if action is not taken right away uh, in quick disasters such, such as shootings, flash floods, tsunami or explosions, for example, where additional seconds can be ma a matter of life and, and death. So recent um, research studies show that uh, during CB experimentation, so it's not reality, but it's a, a research protocol, some people uh, blocked their hair. The loud and penetrating tone was, jar was jarring and unpleasant. And if I have a few seconds, I can make a short experience. Do you know the sound related to a sound notification? Who already heard? this sound. So a few people, <laughs> sure. So to explain my, yeah. So imagine if all of them receive a message with this sound. How did you, how do you react? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> for the short experience. The other problem for researchers is that we, know we, are, we do not have quantitative and precise evaluation. Okay, we can observe different uh, feelings qualitatively, but no quantitative ideas. So thanks to the collaboration with FR Alert, um, we collect new data in France during exercises, so we have limitation. I, I will come back on this uh, at the end of my presentation, but we have uh, the opportunity to collect different information on the feelings the people declare uh, during different exercises, uh, 21 exercises carried out uh, from May to December in 2022 in France. So you can see the different location. So we can observe reaction of people during uh, 15 industrial accidents, free flash flood events, its scenarios, uh, uh, surely, and not reality. Uh, three nuclear incidents, you can locate, locate in this map with the different uh, pictures, and one threat. So the difficulty also for this threat, if you use CB, you need to avoid to inform the people located where the shooting is in progress. So the idea was to send different uh, alerting message in real condition, even if it's an exercise. And we have the chance to add a uh, uh, um, link referring to an online questionnaire. And people can complete the questionnaire. It was in French, sorry, I do not translate it, but it's a, a French protocol. And uh, we do not use Likert scale, but we work with psychologists to, to know what kind of answers we can predefine to um, uh, to make the process short. So I can show you a, a few results. Before we analyzed, so uh, we collect a sample of more than uh, 7,800 fully completed answers. So people answers to all the question. And interestingly, we collect feelings, first feelings and reactions of different people with different ages. So the representation is clearly a, a, a research question, but we cannot verify because we cannot testify the number of people who receive the notification. Fortunately, we have an equality in, for, for the, the gender question. So now a few results. First of all, we see that a large part of um, uh, respondents declare positive or negative answers. First of all, you can see that surprise arise in the top of first feeling as we 
estimate that more than nine, 90% of people declare, yes, I was surprised. Second is the curiosity, 75%. But in the middle of the slide, you can see also that we, yes, validate or observe or measure negative connotation with fear, stress, and mid misunderstanding. The annoyance was clearly rejected because positive answers equal to less than 11%. So it's a first interesting result, even if we can calculate or estimate the average for each exercise, and we can observe differences. So I indicate the standard deviation and the maximum and minimum values we calculate and we estimate between the different exercises. Secondly, it's the first surprising result. The age clearly influenced the, the first feelings. You can see in this map or in this graph that surprise decreases according on the age, but the decrease is not really important in, in green. The curiosity is clearly stable, so the age do not influence the curiosity, like the annoyance. However, you can see the linear decrease for stress, fear, and misunderstanding. And the second result is that this, the maximum, or the mean average, sorry, for each aging group are quite similar. So you can see that the youngest declare that more than 75 young people were clearly afraid receiving the notification, even if it was an exercise. Another result is that we can observe difference between or according the age of the respondents. When we ask them after we reading the notification, what should you do? You can see that the younger do not know how to react, but the curve increase, increases. At the opposite, the number of youngest declare, I looked around me, but this curve decreases with the ages. Another result, and I do not have the answer to explain this, but another result is that we can distinguish the reaction for people with um, 40 years old or less and the others. So we need to work with other researchers to explain this. So to conclude, uh, sure, we have limitations. Limitations are due to different things. First of all, people need to know how to link to access to the online survey. The second is that these results are obtained during the exercises, sure, and these results cannot be transferred in the situation of real alerts, except probably for the impact of sound, because they do not know it was an exercise. And the other problem is that a few respondents or a few participants answered this questionnaire more than one hour after the exercise. So they can, do not remember how they react hearing the sound. So we formulate hypothesis to explain these results. The youngest were probably the most stressed as they felt they had a very good command on, on their phone's functionality. I do not have answer, it's just question. The oldest already heard sirens or fire alarms, so it could explain the, um, the fear and stress of the, the, the gentle mean average for these two parameters. And probably that past experience is induces bias, biases in the perceptions. Whatever the hypothesis and the response, we clearly show that public education activities required awareness actions on CB alerts, regular exercises and trainings, and an air alert, for example, this morning explained that they realized two exercises per year. This also induced trust 
in human capabilities and specific education of onset owners. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Johnny. And uh, yesterday, uh, Romain Moutard said uh, training, training, training for the public. So yes, it's, it's really important. Do we have any question? Yeah, one question. Or you have a mic if you uh, normally it works. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it really echoed a lot of um, the research we are doing on earthquake early warning. So that was very interesting for us. I have a question. Uh, if you are planning to do the questionnaire for real alerts too, or is that only for tests? Um, and the second is um, because we see that there are some stuff that we still don't understand about the age, etc. Do you plan to do interviews um, with people who have received the alerts? Thanks. No. Uh, thank you. Thank you for these two questions. Uh, the first of all, uh, the questionnaire was only diffused for exercises, so we hope to send it uh, during the IS or after. <laughs> it's not the same. Uh, the second question. It is difficult to observe the reaction of people during ex exercises, so we film or we make video on public places, but we are not in each buildings or where the people answer. So it's, it's a clear difficult. We, we know that many people, 70% um, of people answers, they were inside buildings. So I, I think this uh, play a key role on reaction because when you are inside building, you hear your phone. When you are walking or over, you have over noises. So you, this um, could impact your reaction, but it's, easy. it's clearly difficult to measure this. Thank you. Thank you. So for our last speakers is Vasiliki Kotroni, Research Director, Institute of Environmental Research, National Observatory of Athens. And uh, we'll speak about development and operation of early warning system for weather-related hazards at regional and local level in Greece. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, here I will be specifically talking about uh, a, a certain risk which is related uh, to uh, hydrometeorological and uh, climate uh, risks. Okay. Uh, severe and extreme weather events is one of uh, the more uh, important uh, problems uh, in uh, our societies. And uh, our research has shown that the number of uh, recorded uh, disasters that relate to weather and climate has increased by a factor of five in the last 50 years. So it is, has become a, uh, a more and more important problem. And also the problem is that in the future with the climate change, uh, uh, this number is uh, expected to uh, increase uh, in terms of uh, frequency and intensity. And uh, studies have shown that the number of medium uh, scale and large scale disaster events is projected to reach uh, the number of more than 500 per year if uh, no action is taken. And uh, that is the reason why the United Nations at the uh, COP27 uh, meeting uh, have uh, launched the initiative about early warning for early warning systems for all, uh, which calls for early warnings to cover the whole world by uh, 2027. Uh, what is happening in Greece? At the National Observatory of Athens, we have uh, uh, recorded uh, all the high impact weather events that uh, affected Greece since the uh, year 2000. And here in the graph, uh, you can see how this number evolves from year 2000 up to year 2022. And uh, if we separate the decades from 2000 to 2009, we had 167 events, while this number increased the next decade to 2095 events. And if we focused uh, especially in the highest impact events, those have increased from 60 to 90. That means that we had a 50% uh, increase. And here we have only the high impact weather events that uh, uh, are related to severe uh, and extreme weather, but also another uh, important risk for our areas and uh, uh, in the Mediterranean climate is also forest fires, which are also an important environmental uh, risk. 
So uh, early warning systems uh, uh, are widely ex um, uh, uh, regarded as an efficient way to um, uh, uh, take measures for climate change uh, adaptation because they are relatively uh, cheap and effective way to uh, protect both the human lives and also uh, the infrastructure. And uh, namely, how a, a multi-hazard uh, early warning system is built is uh, um, uh, around four pillars, which are shown here uh, on uh, the slide. Uh, the first is disaster risk knowledge. The second, detection, observation, monitoring, analysis, and forecasting of hazards. Warning dissemination and communication and preparedness and response capabilities. And here in, uh, uh, in the next uh, few minutes of my talk, I will talk about what we are doing uh, for the first three pillars at the National Observatory of Athens. And I will uh, start from disaster risk knowledge. For that reason, we systematically collect data. As I already mentioned, we um, uh, catalog and uh, record every high impact uh, weather event, uh, event in a database, which is uh, co uh, continuously updated. And here you can see a map of all the events ha that have uh, uh, affected our country during, uh, since the year 2000. We, have, uh, uh, we are participating in uh, an initiative where we have uh, recorded and catalogued all the flood fatalities uh, since year, uh, year 1980 in many um, countries and areas around uh, Europe, as you can see in the map, uh, where we are trying to find which are the circumstances under which people are losing their lives uh, uh, when a flood uh, is occurring. While also it is important to know about the vulnerabilities and various hazards, so we are building maps, risk maps. Uh, uh, here I'm showing just a, a high resolution map for hail risk in Greece. We're using, we were using a, um, a five level scale to uh, show the risk. Then the second uh, pillar is about detection, uh, observation monitoring, and forecasting. In terms of, of observational uh, network, it is important to uh, build a, a high resolution uh, and dense networks. Here I'm showing uh, what we're doing in Greece. We are operating uh, the densest uh, uh, surface weather uh, station network uh, with more than 500 uh, stations around the country, uh, which are shown here with uh, 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 the circles. We are uh, operating a, a lightning detection network. Lightning also is uh, an important uh, meteorological um, event that uh, is related to hazard, both to life and infrastructure. And also we uh, have uh, uh, metasat receiving antennas uh, that, and we're using NWC SAF products. Those products uh, help us follow uh, the uh, meteorological conditions uh, like uh, precipitation probability uh, and severe weather events, uh, uh, as uh, you can see uh, on uh, this map. In terms of, of forecasting, we uh, use a, a multi-model approach. We are running a number of uh, nuclear weather prediction models, two cycles per day. And we are not only forecasting a typical weather parameters like uh, uh, temperature, uh, precipitation, and so on and so forth, but we have developed specific products like uh, uh, lightning activity forecasting, hail forecasting, uh, fire weather forecasting, which is important uh, during the period from May to October for Greece. And lately, uh, it's uh, three or four years now, uh, we have uh, developed a very innovative tool uh, which is the fire spread forecasting system, which is uh, an online fire and uh, uh, weather uh, uh, prediction system. Uh, is called, it is called IRIS, and we have worked with that uh, we, uh, uh, in collaboration with the fire service. And uh, this system has been called for fire spread forecasting, at least for 20 cases, important uh, fires in the uh, year uh, 2020. Based on uh, our forecasting capabilities, we have uh, built some uh, uh, types of uh, smart alerts. Namely, we have de developed the Rainfall Precipitation Index. It's uh, a five scale, as you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, 
which uh, not only takes into account the precipitation forecast uh, in terms of uh, level of precipitation, but also it takes into account for the scaling the areas that will be affected and the population which be, uh, will be affected. Uh, like uh, this uh, 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 index, but for uh, heat wave categories, we have done the same for the urban area of Athens. This is the biggest and the largest uh, um, city in uh, Athens, the capital. It's an urban area and we suffer from uh, heat waves here. This uh, four scale uh, category uh, has been built based on uh, 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 on temperature, on human discomfort, but also we use the mortality data to um, make uh, this, uh, this scaling. So that those are smart alerts uh, uh, that have been built for the area. And all this uh, experience that we're having, we're using and put it together to develop uh, uh, early warning systems for uh, regions. Like uh, here is the system that we have developed for the region of Attica where Athens City Center also uh, is included, uh, where uh, we uh, are showing uh, all the observations. Here we have the observations from our um, uh, network of uh, surface stations. Uh, we uh, are showing forecasts about temperature, wind, uh, so on for, uh, so forth. And also, by pressing uh, the certain points over Attica, one can see how the weather will evolve in the next uh, uh, hours and days in, temperature, in terms of temperature, rainfall, and so on. But also, we can go even smarter than that, and we can show forecasts uh, on, the, on the network, of the, on the road network. Here, for example, is an example of the forecast where with green is the areas or the roads that, uh, uh, where there will be no rain, with um, blue, the uh, roads where there will be rain, with uh, dark blue where it will be snowing. And this is for rainfall, or we can uh, also um, uh, divide the region in uh, municipalities and develop the um, alerts uh, for temperature, uh, like the example there, for uh, various municipalities, uh, because not all uh, areas suffer from the same uh, problem or the same level of, uh, of risk. Uh, Okay, and I'm going to the third pillar. The third pillar is about uh, warning dissemination and communication. And uh, for that reason, uh, we have developed uh, www.meteo.gr is uh, the website that targets uh, mostly uh, the uh, general public. It's, it is visited by more than uh, 350,000 uh, daily visitors, which uh, big. Uh, uh, increase a lot when uh, a severe weather uh, event is expected and we reach more than uh, 700,000 uh, uh, people. Uh, we have Facebook, uh, Viber, subscribers. Uh, we are a prime source of weather-related information for uh, Greek media and also we are presenting the weather in, ta in uh, tables because this is the easiest way for uh, the general public to get the information. And with that, I uh, finish by giving... Uh, some concluding remarks about uh, our experience. Uh, it's important to invest on observation networks. If we cannot measure, you cannot solve a problem. Incorporate uh, innovation. And mostly here, I should say that we should develop impact-based forecasts. This is very important. Develop early warning systems that are targeting local level in collaboration with local respondents and volunteers. Invest on education. This is important. We must uh, uh, educate res first respondents, volunteers, and the general public. And of course, to do so, we need the uh, multi-sectoral collaborations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we have one little question, on, I'm sorry, Laura, you, did, you had one before, so please, please, one little question, please, <laughs> sir. Um, that was really nice. I'm curious in your colors that you chose to use on flooding and severity, and then the colors you chose to use on heat. Did y'all do testing in terms of understanding the different colors that you were going to use to indicate severity? Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, as I have shown, we have uh, used uh, mostly the same uh, level uh, of colors that increased our reds and uh, the reddest 
if it's the correct uh, word, is the, the highest level of risk. But uh, uh, we're using those, uh, th th this uh, scale and after having communicated through our site with a layman article what its color means. And we remind people, each time we are giving this uh, triangle, we remind about the severity. There is also a medium, severe, very high. So it's the color and um, a wording to be more efficient. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you to have been here with us for this uh, Research Corner session. Uh, for the next session, you have Galus Hall Next Generation E-Call, Linart Hall Additional Data in Emergency Communication, uh, Steel Hall, STI Hall Masterclass Artificial Intelligence and Chatbot, what are they and what should we consider when use, using them in critical services? And here you have the emergency communication handling around the world. Thank you very much.